you're also supplementing fish recovery efforts through NOAA and other federal agencies. So we spend about a billion dollars, it's like 900 to 1 billion, 900 million to $1 billion on fish recovery efforts for Idaho's salmon and steelhead to no avail. We've spent 26 billion with a B dollars through ratepayer dollars and taxpayer dollars, the most expensive species recovery effort in world history. Let me say that again. $26 billion, the most expensive species recovery effort in world history, to no avail. Hey, yeah. look, there you go, man. God bless it. Thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, one of the most confused looks I ever had on one of my students' faces is when I explained to her that in order to protect giraffe and rhinoceros in Africa, it was in everybody's best interest to like issue game tags and let people hunt them. And she's like, but you're killing the rhinos and the giraffes. I'm like, I understand that. I understand that. But you're not killing all of them, right? And with the money, like make the tag as expensive as you make it a million dollars. I don't care. Mm -hmm. And then you, let's say you give 20 giraffe tags for a million dollars each. Now you have $20 million to protect all of the other giraffes that mm -hmm. weren't one of the 20, right? Mm -hmm. And having, introducing the idea that there needs to be an economic, social, broad understanding of the world to actually make meaningful conservation decisions is just so foreign to people. Yeah, the idea that hunting is conservation is, it's not a new one, but um, with uh, society today, especially in America, it's certainly foreign. And um, I mean, yeah, it's it, wildlife, commodifying wildlife to the full extent of making them a marketable product is not always a wise idea. However, in instances where species are threatened especially um, or have high value therefore there's going to be illegal poaching um, applying those market values is actually a pretty good way to raise money to pay conservation officers to keep poachers out to pay for habitat i mean that's what we do here in the united states right it's called the north american model of wildlife conservation a user pays model if you want to hunt deer and elk you need to pay for a tag and that money will go towards the management that will create a surplus population so that we can actually harvest these animals in a sustainable way because if we don't put money back into the system to create this surplus population the population goes down and down and down and down uh, before we had the north american model i mean we had species that we take for granted today that were almost extinct turkeys white-tailed deer mule deer and uh, once you start paying for enforcement officers and habitat management things started going really well those are some of the most successful species recovery efforts in world history man okay so walk me back because you you are the executive director of the idaho wildlife federation correct you have a master's in conservation you obviously are deeply invested in maintaining a functional environment that can be enjoyed by a wide swath of people walk me back on how you got there okay uh how did Oliver Twist start? Ah. I was. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, no, I I uh, I have a family that uh, on my uh, on my dad's side came from Wisconsin, um, so I have no choice in being a Packers fan. But yeah. they're from Green Bay, and we still have a farm over there. And um, they grew up hunting and fishing and doing all that great stuff, going up to the North Woods. My the, my mom's side of family were sheep ranchers in what's now like. South Central California. And um, that kind of, you know, my parents were really good. And as a new father myself, um, it takes a lot of effort, as you know, to get kids to go outside. I mean, as parents, you're just working, you're not necessarily enjoying, but <laughs> they, they did an excellent job. Now I can appreciate it um, of just getting us outside all day, every day, especially in the summers. My mom worked in the public school system. She had summers off. My dad was really good about taking time off. He's a civil engineer, and we would go on these long road trips from Idaho. We'd go up north towards Lolo, go through Montana. Uh, we'd go south then down to Wyoming, Flaming Gorge area, down to Colorado where my uncle lived. And then we'd drive back through the Green River, through Utah, and back up. And that whole time, we were fly fishing. And we have world-class fly fishing here in the Northern Rockies. 
that whole time I mean, we were seeing rare birds we saw grizzly bears swimming across rivers while we were standing in the middle of them i mean we, it was a it was a dream like childhood you know and when i got bored with fishing i was catching frogs and you know looking into just we loved being in nature and um when we weren't on the road trips we had the south fork of the boise river right here which is blue ribbon trout fishing 80 minute drive away and we have world-class hunting here in Idaho, central Idaho and uh, southwestern Idaho is where we focus most of our hunting growing up. But I've also been to every corner of the state chasing whitewater, hunting birds and all that kind of stuff. And so when I was in college and I went to U of I, I was a journalism major first and it, I wasn't feeling it. It's just like, this isn't, I don't want to do this. You, <laughs> so, you made a really good call, by the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> <That's laughs> a rough one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nowadays, absolutely. So I... Um, I talked to my advisor at the time and I said, I'm just, I don't know what to do here. Uh, I'm not feeling school. And he just said, tell you what, like make a concerted effort to go do what you want to do this weekend. Like seriously, go do whatever it is you like doing and come back and we'll talk next week. And I, I came back to him and he asked what I did. I said, Oh, I went fishing and um, cause there was nothing in season at the time and uh, to hunt. And he just said, I'm going to hook you up with a guy from the College of Natural Resources. And that set me on a path to getting my education in conservation. And my, my undergraduate degree was called, it's not offered anymore. It's been morphed into something else, but it was called conservation social science. And the idea is you're learning the sort of human dimensions of conservation, um, how do you encapsulate that? So say there's this river that's a protect, like that's got like great fishing and it's an economic resource to a local community, but it's under threat by some mine or something. <clears throat> and it's more about like the politics of how you get to what people want out of a resource. And, um, you know, if you want to protect that economic resource of the fishery, you have to talk about protecting it environmentally, but not in a way that might hurt other industries. So you need to learn about the economics of everything that might be produced in a local region, how you talk to different leaders. And it's just the human dimensions of conserving an ecological resource. And um, that was, how do I put this? <laughs> I just wanted to fish. <laughs> <laughs> but I realized, and hunt, but I realized in order to hunt and fish, you have to um, get into politics because politics dictates how resources are managed and we can go totally one way and, and extractive um, commodity resource extraction, but then you don't have the environmental balance that allows people to go fishing and go hunting the things that they might not do from um, an economic standpoint, though there is economics attached to hunting sure. and fishing, of course. Um, but that's something that is a quality of life thing. It's a, it's a life balance. And so um, that, um, Help me realize that if I wanted to continue to hunt and fish, if I wanted my kids to have that opportunity and I wanted all Americans to realize what is so awesome about hunting and fishing and perpetuate that opportunity, um, I'm going to have to understand uh, economics and people and politics and communications and, and all the structures that are associated with those. And so um, uh, I graduated at a, a really bad time to graduate, 2008. Uh, God bless it. <laughs> I couldn't the, get. I got out just four years prior. Yeah. Right. Like, if I may, 2008, I actually think it may have been a better time frame because when you graduate and the world's falling apart, you're like, well, mom, I'm coming back. Right. Here we go. Like, you just move back because you're like, look, the world's falling apart. I have no option. You graduate in 2004, everything's great. <laughs> everyone's like, oh my God, the world is fantastic. It's full of opportunity. Here we go, Brian. Here we get, it's going to be great. And then by 2008, you've made a whole bunch of commitments like car payments or a mortgage <laughs> and all because you're like, because it's great because everything's great and you don't mm -hmm. have enough life. Like if you graduate in 2000, now by 2008, you're like 30. You're like, I've seen mm -hmm. a little bit, like I have some savings, like, and I'm, I'm a little bit more, but when you're 26 and everything has been hunky dory since you graduated, you just get hosed. So it was a rough time, but it was a rough time, but it also, it gave me that, like you said, it was, it was an opportunity. It was easy to recognize that this was rock bottom. Like right. I was bartending at, at, with a degree. I was like the caricature of a recent college grad. Um, but because there was no real, uh, economic outlook, I decided to go back to school and an opportunity came. It was a job at the University of Idaho, actually. And if you work for university, one of the perks is getting really dirt cheap credits. Mm. And it was $5 a credit. 
and uh, to get a master's, I think that's like what, 30 something, 36 credits. And so 36 times five, pretty reasonable. My books. You, sp you spent 180 bucks for your master's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. But you know, that's, it's funny because I've, I've heard, you hear it all the time, like don't pay for college, find a way, like whether it's a grant or, or scholarships or something like that. I didn't have that opportunity uh, for my undergrad, but I, I jumped on it. I was making pretty bad money, um, but the opportunity was for the next two and a half years, I'm going to essentially cash out with this master's. Um, right. So, and that was in natural resource management. I got a much more rounded um, understanding through uh, of, uh, policy, natural resource policy, but also this interdisciplinary uh, structure, a better understanding of economics and how it pertains to rural Idaho, especially places that rely on natural resources, whether it's steelhead and salmon fishing or hunting guides or timber harvest and mining, those traditional um, economies as well, or industries. And and a better understanding of, of politics and all that kind of stuff too. So that's... Um, that's how I got into this uh, situation. When and when I, the opportunity came with the Idaho Wildlife Federation, I mean, it was an organization that has a rich history. It ran successfully and passed Idaho's first citizens initiative, which passed in 1938. The organization was founded in 1936, and these citizens initiatives established the Department of Fish and Game Commission, which at the time was a way to remove wildlife management from political jeopardy at the time like the yeah. governor was like giving out trophy bull tags to political donors and we were like giving out there was no real enforcement mechanism for harvesting too many fish or like some people who were big political donors wouldn't get fined for adhering to certain laws conservation laws so people were pit, like they were not happy about the way the state of wildlife management and I mean, can you imagine today's society like caring enough about that to pass? And it passed by 76%. It was an insane turnout. And um, I mean, people really were so connected to wildlife back then that three quarters of the state decided we needed science management of wildlife, not political mismanagement. It's, it's wild to me that you had an engaged populace and an educated populace. Because I mean, think about it, 1938, World War One right depression the or excuse me world war ii depression the whole thing yet somehow people were in tune mm -hmm. with the graph and and nefarious behaviors of their political like it's so hard to convince anybody now i mean i think most people think that their politicians are not fantastic but they can't like really put their finger on it but yeah. back in 1938 they're like he gave bill a, a trophy mm -hmm. you know elk tag or something or like that guy's been ripping fish out of the river uh, with impunity <laughs> right like we got to get them out they're like yeah i know i heard about that too i saw him it's like how are people doing that like today you could say you know it's it's a good idea to breathe air and you'll get a 48 52 split on whether that's uh, agreeable or not. <laughs> like, oh, just a you're joke. gonna have a Wim Hof <laughs> Wim Hof breath control guy. He's like, well, you get too much oxygen. Actually, it's like, <laughs> just stop, man. I can't. He's like, if you do breath work, you stop breathing. Actually, it's better for your immune system and you get less depression. Mm -hmm. Like, I a thousand percent agree. We yeah. could look up Instagram right now and find like a huge following. Mm -hmm. yeah. But people are so split today. But back then, I think we were just really we were far more connected to the natural resources of of the world. And I mean, it was harder. Like, you know, I think back then, like one in two jobs was related to agriculture. And now it's like one in 50. And if you're out on the land, you're seeing birds, you're seeing ducks, you're seeing pheasants, you're seeing all this stuff. And and now I, I don't think that we could pass that initiative today. And there's also that's not just a relation to people and natural resources, but it's also a state of politics and where politicians are at today, because there's a lot of movement to try to privatize like elk tags an opportunity because hunting and fishing right now is pretty egalitarian you pay 35 bucks for an elk tag a 16 year old with no money has as much opportunity to shoot a trophy bull as a billionaire because they pay for a 35 dollar tag too now that we do have auction tag systems idahoans largely have rejected that system of managing wildlife for now what's but, what's the auction system? um setting aside some trophy tags for like bighorn sheep goats even like trophy class bucks and bulls and um basically it goes to the highest bidder and um we typically have there's one individual from idaho eastern idaho who continually outbids everybody else for a sheep tag every year he pays about a half million dollars four hundred thousand to five hundred thousand dollars per year for a sheep tag and um that's fine the money does go to conservation like we said and there is a potential benefit to that however we have not seen a correlated increase in bighorn sheep numbers with as since we've been auctioning off those tags 
that's a different story in the weeds. But um, a lot of people in Idaho don't like it because otherwise we'd have a lottery. And people who, most people in Idaho are blue collar, don't make a million dollars a year, can't afford to spend $400,000 for um, a sheep tag. So they don't like that you get put in the front of the line, you get to cut around people to have opportunity just because you have more income. Okay, so back to the sheep thing. There's a mm-hmm. guy, four or $500,000, fine, and he gets this sheep tag, right? How many tags for Bighorn, just, is it just one? Like how many tags go we, out? We auction off only one. The okay. commission has the authority, the Fishing Game Commission, which IWF, again, ran the campaign to create. Um, they have the authority to decide how much they give away. Largely, the hunting populace has said, we do not want any more than just this sheep tag. So we auction off one and we do a lottery for the other. And there are a handful of sheep tags, though, that are general lottery. Um, sorry, there's a lottery, which you can buy as many tickets as you like. And sure. then there's the auction. Those two are set aside. Sure. Then you do kind of the more to hunt, to get another, the other sheep tags that exist, and there aren't many. Um, they're based off of uh, population of the sheep tags in different units. There's not many. There's just a handful that go out. So there's like the Bora region, which is a really coveted tag. There's a Wahi tag, and it's also like the Hell's Canyon area that is really coveted. That's another sort of draw system, we call it. But um, that's based off population. The auction tag one is just like a straight up whoever pays the most. Whoever pays the most. Okay. Now you said this, uh, you made a really quick point that you glossed over that I think is really important. You're like, listen, the, the problem it sounds like is that the nature of the tags is we need conservation efforts that actually enrich and um, improve the populations of these animals we're hunting, right? Mm-hmm. So this bighorn sheep auction item goes out, the tag goes out, $500,000, this guy grabs it. But that $500,000, it sounds like, is not really correlating to an improved state of existence for the sheep populations. Is that is that correct? That is absolutely correct. And and the reasons are, there's a, there's a few other reasons, but it's... it's um, reduction in quality habitat and there are some reasons behind that there's invasive species uh, like cheatgrass is not super nutritious uh wild feral horses um, really trample mm. the heck out of riparian areas and those are areas that are really like provide a lot of biodiversity and and, and sort of um good ecological base for a lot of species including sage grass um and also you know there's uh sheep domestic sheep um, they spread a virus that um, once it gets into a wild sheep herd and they detect it, instead of removing the domestic sheep, we will kill all of the wild sheep in that herd because it's it's pretty much always fatal. Um, but so we're basically keeping it from spreading that herd from reaching another herd and reaching another herd. So, but our our default is to just wipe out the wild sheep. Oh, so. Man. We have other policies in place, whether it's lack of funding for habitat um, recovery or it's our kind of bad fire policy. We're getting better. But, you know, we have we've had this hundred years of fire suppression um, ethos that has like allowed a lot of fuels to build up. Once those like we have a really bad one, it's hard for the native species to come back, plant species. And it's usually pioneered by cheatgrass. Um, And then we also have some agriculture reigns supreme especially in a state like idaho um and we protect domestic sheep typically over over wild sheep so um, there's a number of policies that feed into this so no matter how much money you throw at bighorn sheep habitat and there's it it still does good stuff like it can pay for satellite gps callers we can learn where they're at when and why sure um which helps but um as long as we have like other overarching policies that they're not going to let sheep really flourish so um regardless so you know sometimes if you Like I said before, if you can commodify hunting like the systems we have in Africa, it can raise a whole lot of money and it can do a whole lot of good. But in certain instances where we have other policies in place, it it can't. Those are like barriers. No matter how much money you throw at it, if those policies don't change, it's not going to help. Right. And again, going back to what you were saying, even before we turn on the mic, that the nature of the interdisciplinary uh, necessity of conservation is profound. And if you're talking about wiping out potential um, uh, nutrient sources just with building codes, mm-hmm. right, like <laughs> and things of that nature, and then other ag- other industries like agriculture, you're really – you're really going to run into massive problems. So it's kind of like, look, even though we're doing the sheep right, there's no way for the sheep to thrive, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. uh, understanding understanding those other policies. Yeah. Um, okay, so 
all of that, <laughs> all of that. But that brings you mm-hmm. to your current <clears throat> campaign with Salmon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let me round out if I can. Please um, do. And so, we, we're yeah, not in yeah, a rush yeah, at yeah. all. Just go, go, go. Yeah, I've got time. Um, the, the, the Federation, as I mentioned, started in 1936. Our first big splash was, uh, and this is an interesting story, because there's another group, not an official nonprofit. They're called the Poachers. And they don't poach. That's It's the moniker that they have adopted. Um, <laughs> so... 1936, IWF is formed by some very influential people in the state of Idaho, including a, a judge. And there have been governors who have been members of, of Idaho Wildlife Federation and this group called the Poachers. But the Poachers were sort of some guys, drinking buddies. They got together and said, we need to change things in the state of Idaho. So they helped found uh, IWF, but they remained a drinking club or a mm. breakfast club, whatever you want to call them. <laughs> and um, uh, sometimes you can combine those things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was going to say. <laughs> um, they started this campaign and the state at the time before we had a commission we had a state game warden he was the top dog at fishing game and uh the iwf and and these guys that one didn't have a name yet they went to the legislature and said hey we we have a bill to create this independent fishing game commission nonpartisan, science-based blah 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 the legislature uh, rebuked them they said well in two years uh we'll come back and that was in that two years that's when they worked across you know grassroots campaign to pass this initiative in that time Somebody interviewed the state game warden and said, hey, are you aware of this, these uh, guys that are coming for your job um, that are, and he's like, yeah, I'm aware of those poaching sons of bitches down there. Uh, <laughs> they adopted that moniker, calling themselves poachers, and I'm a member of the poachers, and we still <laughs> greet each other to this day as sons of bitches. Um, so anyways, that's interesting and funny Idaho in history. And, um, but since then, we've had many campaigns. Our fingerprints are all over the state of Idaho. If you enjoy the Sawtooth National Recreation Area, if you hunt in the Frank Church Wilderness, the delineation of that, keeping the Middle Fork of the Salmon River undammed, um, one of the most cherished whitewater rivers in the world, um, that was IWF. I mean, there were proposals to build a sheep dam to make sure that that was not a free-flowing river anymore. And and so, anyways, that's it's, it's a very rich history. And um, <clears throat> as a chaplain's with many nonprofits, small nonprofits, there are good years and bad years. When I took over, they were damn near, um, they were almost done. They, uh, they didn't have any money. They didn't have an office. And, uh, basically they said, Hey, you can have this job. (laughs) We can't pay you. Um, but you can, if you can build it up, have at it. And, um, as a kid, as I mentioned, growing up in Idaho, hunting and fishing wants to make like, it was like, an opportunity to fight for the things that I hold dearest to my heart. And that is being out in the woods and hunting and fishing. And, um, I took it up. That was in 2016. And since then we have grown exponentially. We have 28 affiliate organizations. We have five staff. We have a big endowment fund that'll have a long-term sort of funding mechanism for our organization. And, uh, hunting and fishing advocacy in Idaho is, is really important. And this organization will be around a long time now. God, congratulations. Thanks. I uh, I have to say, as a side note, the number of people that I meet here, I don't know what it is about the state. I don't know if it's that the actual, the actual people or, or that it's almost like the state isn't so big and the bureaucracy hasn't become so crushing. I don't know what it is, but I meet people like you and like a, like a few other others recently that are actually doing things like meaningful things that aren't. You know, like little pet projects that like, hey, look, I essentially have something to do while I'm still doing this. But the second I'm done with this, like the project's gone or they start, you know, people start organizations and they're like, well, you know, I was really I was really invested in this idea when this thing mattered and it doesn't really matter anymore. So, you know, I'm kind of out of it. But again, it's it's people that are of great competence and vision and actually have the horsepower to make change that I keep, that keep popping up around me. I'm like, where are you people coming from? So again, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to hear that, you know, I have three boys and gosh, man, my youngest loves fishing. He wants to do nothing but fish. I have to take him sometimes when the weather's better. I take him down to the river before school. Like he wants to go fishing at 7 a.m., right? Yeah, like that 8 was me. That was me. Excellent. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's fantastic. And he's trash at fishing. Like it's not <laughs> like he catches anything. He just loves the process. Yeah. He in particular has an incredible 
energy system, mm. right? I'm, I got a lot of giddy up in me and all of my, I have three boys, all three of my boys have it, but he in particular has a real system that just needs activity. Like he, he can't tolerate tech. Yeah. He'll play a little bit of video games or something, but he just, he just has to get moving. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I heard a, 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 a conversation uh, years back that was discussing how the Amish essentially address the different character traits that emerge with with every generation. They're like, look, if you have somebody who's really creative and really into woodworking, they just make them go hang out with the woodworkers, right? Yeah. Like that's not that crazy. If you have somebody that loves animals, like you make them hang out in the barn and like take care of the animals. And the the idea is like you have all these different places for people and then the question mm-hmm. becomes well, what do you do with the people that we classically consider like ADHD or mm-hmm. like totally you know all of a sudden you're like oh they go hang out with the with the hunters and fishers right <laughs> like they, they they have so much action and mm-hmm. so many variables to track mm-hmm. in these endeavors and it's so deeply deeply engaging on like a fundamental level we uh we took our kids fishing for um the first time we took them and i didn't very unfortunate i didn't have a chance to grow up fishing same way i grew up in northern california i tried to go open water swimming a couple years back and the closest place was like 45 minutes away it's like fine i'll drive down there and then i was reading reviews right before i left it's like oh yeah dodge the dirty diapers like mm-hmm. floating around in the mm-hmm. oh it's just horrible and you're like that's that's the world mm-hmm. that i grew up in right so moving up here <laughs> has been wonderful so we take our boys fishing and again I was like, how is this going to go down? Because like, I think he was five or something at the time. I was like, my five-year-old is going to be, you know, long, like crazy about this. No, man. He locked in. Like, mm. we put that pole in his hand. I showed him. I was like, hold your finger here. Cast the whole thing. He he did nothing but cast that rod for like an hour and a half. We are like, we got to go, man. He's like, no, I'm yeah. not leaving. And it, again, such a beautiful thing that we would have never had the opportunity to do elsewhere. Mm-hmm. So it's it's one of those things that I, I deeply believe that this style of life, the style of engagement is not – for some people, it's very much recreation, just weekend things. But for, I think for other people, it holds a different place yeah. in, their like, in their life arc. I've, I've tried to find where in my body – or sorry. I've tried to find where in my body, my brain, my heart, the drive – comes from for that kind of activity um but it makes sense what you're saying to me because i mean it's funny you (laughs) to someone who doesn't fish watching someone sitting on a dock or on a riverbank cast a thousand times with to no avail is like that guy's broken right like (laughs) Like, what is he doing (laughs) he's broken there's something wrong with him but I mean, and I, I don't want to be too poetic. I, I don't know. You've probably seen or at least heard of the movie, if not the book, River Runs Through It. And, and fly fishermen especially tend to get a little too poetic for the average Joe to understand the specialty of fishing. And I don't just fly fish. I crappie fish and bass fish and do all the warm water stuff too. They're great great for eating. I don't eat trout anymore. Bless my dad. He, he would cook every single trout that we kept. And I think I'm, I'm trouted trout meated out i don't want to eat any more trout but (laughs) and frankly there are better tasting fish out there like perch and crappie but um fishing and hunting it combines what i have thought about and i've had a lot of time standing in a river or sitting on a mountainside glassings looking through binoculars at the opposite hillsides looking for animals there are moments of profound beauty sun coming up or appearing through clouds i mean it's it's art um what you're seeing um there are moments of the most insane adrenaline rush of your life when a massive bull walks out of the trees and you're like, Oh my God, I'm going to kill the biggest animal on the mountain. And I'm going to, it's going to be awesome. Um, it's incredibly hard work there. It's exercise. Like it's, it's exu- it, you're, you're getting rid of some of that pent up energy. We probably have too much of from the, the lifestyle we live now. I mean, hiking this, this year, I got a, a bull and, um, hiked it out and it was, it was too far down the hill. <laughs> I saw these animals and I went down like 3000 feet elevation and I had to carry that thing back up. And that took like multiple trips. I was beat, but like, it's just, it combines all of these elements that are sometimes so different. Like you wouldn't think that adrenaline and exercise could be mixed with like the most profound beauty sunrise you've ever seen in the woods. And if you're sharing that with friends or your family, it elevates it even higher. And it's something that's really, really hard to explain beyond that. Um, until you experience it. Yeah. It's the, the limited amount of hunting I've done. Um, and my dad lived up in Alaska for 25 years. He just recently moved around the corner from me, which is awesome. He's in his early seventies, 
but he he would go hunting. We go like black bear hunting. Um, that's actually when I was really introduced to the idea of conservation because I'm like, you're killing a black at 18, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're killing a black bear. What are you doing, dad? And he's like, no, no, no. It's actually good for the population. I'm like, mm-hmm. how the mm-hmm. fuck dad? Like, <laughs> listen, I know you think mm-hmm. I'm an idiot and I was an idiot. Mm-hmm. I was like, I know you think I'm an idiot dad, mm-hmm. but like, <laughs> I know when you're killing an animal, mm-hmm. you're not. And again, just ignorance. I didn't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, so all those things I just described, it doesn't even apply like once you have an understanding of like the science of like, you know, pulling an old boar or black bear out of a population promotes genetic diversity. Females yes. have to go to. So there's there's science that you can apply on top of it. If you have an understanding of that, then all of a sudden the connection is so much more profound and deeper. And that doesn't even touch like, you know, the guys who go bird hunting. I'm a bird hunter. I have a black lab. I Thousands of hours training this black lab to watch him do the exact right thing to flush a bird out, to cut the wind, cut the sand. And then like, so then there's like a, your work is paying off. You're applying skills and it might not even be your skills. It might be the skills you taught your son or your dog or whatever. I mean, like it just, it blows up when you have, when you put more effort into it. And, and that effort includes education about ecosystems and ecology. Right. And that's, that's what I mean. It's, it, it's almost like people, I think a lot of people moving from states like California have, and again, nothing, again, I grew up in California and, you know, I moved here more recently. Um, I think it's very difficult for people to understand the where this style of engagement fits into a life arc outside of something you might just do on the weekend. It's like, no, no, no. I spent three years training my dog for like these 45 seconds. Like you don't understand this. <laughs> and like my son, I've been raising him to with like – you know, the 10 pound packs on his back. So when he was 12, we could go mm-hmm. hunting and he could contribute. Like there, there are aspects of this lifestyle that, that are so, it's so difficult for, I, I think a lot mm-hmm. of uh, Californians, the more uh, densely packed metropolitan areas. What's interesting is California in general is not a blue state. Like there are tiny little pockets of blue, mm-hmm. but the vast majority of California is actually very red. You yeah. go into the mountains. There's a lot of rural areas. Yeah. A lot of rural areas. And you just don't – they don't mix – those people don't come into the metropolitan areas frequently. Mm-hmm. And when they do, a lot of people in the metro – like I have a relative who I don't really care for. But he's like this pretentious little – I'm not going to say, I'm not going to finish that, but like, are you going to see him at Christmas here? In no, a couple of, okay, okay. No, okay, so no, can, okay. thank God. <laughs> no, it's over. It's over with him. But mm-hmm. it's like the, the pretentious nature of, I think a lot of, uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the, the just people tend towards and the miseducation, right? So we're talking about education here. So I, I'm going to Berkeley. They have to, uh, they have to build a new stadium. They don't have to, but they're like, I know what we should do. Invest half a billion dollars into a new stadium because our football team sucks and this will help. It didn't <laughs> help. And uh, so they're like, all right, well, but what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to cut down for like California oaks, mm, right? Mm-hmm. And big oak trees, like I'm not, I'm not all for cutting down oak trees, even though they, they hollow out from the inside and kill people all the time. Yeah. Whatever though, let's protect them. <laughs> so they have these trees and of course, out of the woodworks, people come, they're like, you can't cut down these trees. They're like, yeah, I know we're going to have to cut down these trees, guys. So this group of the, the tree sitters, they oh boy. climb into the trees Right. They, and these are like big old oak trees. So they mm-hmm. climb into them. It's literally like if they were blue, it would have been Avatar. Like they're <laughs> living in the tree. Right. And they're not coming down because they know if they come down, the police are down there. They're like, we're going to haul you away. So they stay in the tree. And initially it's like, was it going to be like a day or two? Months. These people Whoa. stayed in the tree like they were committed. So what they had to eventually do, what the authorities did is they built a one way fence, right? Razor wire and everything. And somehow they were getting food, but they were like literally hauling buckets of, you could imagine, up and down oh out of the trees. They weren't coming down out of the trees. And of course, they ended up leaving. A political science uh, professor at Cal had a contest. They're like, all right, whoever wins this contest gets to go to the faculty club with me. Uh, how do you get the tree the tree sitter people out? And uh, the winner said, all right, this is what you do. Piece of cake. They'll be out in a snap. It's like, you go to the base of the tree. <clears throat> and you set a watch and you say every hour that goes by, I'm executing an endangered species. So it's like you get the <laughs> snow out and then you get like a bald eagle or something mm-hmm. like just whatever. And you just start and they, they would come out. But those are the conservationists and environmentalists that a lot of 
and again, those two words aren't necessarily analogous, mm-hmm, but those mm-hmm. are a lot of the people that advocate for wilderness. So mm-hmm. the metropolitan metropolitan population sees like the tree people that are uh, hoisting yeah. buckets of feces up and down as like mm-hmm. crazy people. When in reality, the rest of the world's like, no, 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 it's actually good to like protect rivers and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. don't do that. Mm-hmm. That's a bad idea. Mm-hmm. Because again, to your point. You have to understand the draws and the necessity, the, the requirements of other industries, other groups, other organizations to find a reasonable solution mm-hmm. to, to the problem you're presenting. You don't just get to say your problem is the most important problem and everyone else should just right. fall in line. Yeah. And I think my education and also just like growing up in Idaho, sharing uh, elk camp, like campfires with people you didn't know, typically pretty rural folks uh and i grew up in boise and i'm not going to pretend i didn't but i i lived in mccall and i lived in in moscow as well but I, i'm not i've spent a lot of time out in those areas and and and, and you just learn a lot and and you kind of realize that like like what you just said like my desire to hunt like there's a way that we can continue to hunt and fish in a way that doesn't hurt the timber industry in a way that doesn't hurt other people and their livelihoods or ability right. to keep the lights on, buy Christmas presents for their kids or whatever. I mean, it's just like, there is a sort of like, I think environmentalists through stunts like that, uh, have ruined it for the rest of us who do care about the environment and, um, the products and resources that come out of it and who want to work with industry and work with communities to talk about ways that we can sustain the thing that I like, while sustaining and maybe even enhancing what you have and that, but it's like there are a lot of people who put their foot in the sand and say i'm not here to work with other people i'm here for my thing i'm here for this oak tree that's it like everyone else be damned and that that has really hurt um the rest of us who are pragmatic right <laughs> right and and again the, we were talking very briefly before we turn on the mics about the uh native american tribe up north i think it's the nez Perce tribe and Shout out, if anybody's listening to this that has connection, I would love to talk to these people. So they, that tribe and tribes in general are very concerned about the the river systems in Idaho, understandably. And Idaho is an incredible source of hydroelectric. You get hydroelectric by messing with the rivers and damming them and doing all kinds of things of that nature. (laughs) And as a result, they actually have this campaign to create, I think it's like a five megawatt solar system, Mm -hmm. right? So they're making like the largest solar farm or attempting to make the largest solar farm Mm -hmm. in Idaho to replace the electricity from those dams. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like, instead of just banging a drum and screaming at people about how they're not getting what they need, and they may be screaming at people too, but they're also like, okay, I'm really not happy. And I'm going to work to a solution, right? Like this is a solution. You need electricity, I'll get you electricity, right? Yeah. You People in Idaho need electricity. I mean, and they need electricity. Like everybody uses electricity to some degree. It's like you can't just say you should no longer need it mm-hmm. or we're going to jack the mm-hmm. price of it mm-hmm. up it, it, like two or three times just for my issue, right? Yeah. Because again, the impact on other people. I When I heard that months back, I found that to be the most incredible like legitimate, engaged, problem-solving solution tied to conservation Mm -hmm. I had ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my God, here's a Native American tribe that's utilizing the most cutting-edge solar technology Mm -hmm. to then go backwards and gain access to functional, healthy river systems again. It's like, my mind just exploded. Now, more than ever, and and we... IWF and myself, we work with uh, the tribes, most mainly the, the Shobans and the Shoshonebanics and the Nez Perce on a number of issues um, because obviously they care about natural resources as well and, and the ability to, to hunt and fish. And for them, it has a far deeper meaning. I mean, we can get into this a, a little bit later, but salmon, for instance, are a part of their creation story. Um, they, they are a deity on this earth to them. And that's something I can't even begin to imagine. But as if, if there's any, you know, Christians listening, that that's the fish gave their life to, for them to sustain themselves. And that has been for 10,000 years. And so it's it's just it's take what Jesus means to you and apply it to them. And they can actually see and touch these things. And because of river management practices that we're employing now, we're destroying their deity. And that's that's how that's what it means to them beyond just the ability to catch a fish. But <clears throat> now more than ever 
tribes are really taking into their own hands their own destinies and I, and I will not speak for the tribes and I could probably hook you up with somebody to speak with I would I would love that but they are putting in place practical steps to replace the power generation and it's it's now it's way beyond five megawatts it's it's thousands and oh. but people probably are a little leery of the ability or the uh, effects or so I shouldn't say effects the uh, how viable solar and wind energy is because they're like well the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow but what they have done is they have also installed uh tesla battery packs to oh, store the power walls <laughs> so it's 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 storage capacity because if you mm. think about dams the 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 biggest benefit they provide is when we have peak demand you flip a switch you can run water through the water stored is like a battery right if you can replace that baseload power need you can do that with pa um, battery technology now, and in like another ten years, it's going to far surpass what dams can do. Um, then that, that's what they are doing as well, right? Mm -hmm. And, and the, then it comes down to just load shifting, right? Yep. So like you have mm -hmm. to have. There was a battery uh, uh, that I saw, uh, got some information about that. Essentially, they're stackable circle. They were made by. A, I just saw this video about uh, the MIT professor making them, but mm -hmm. they were far better than even than even Tesla Powerwalls, which is great. And speaking of batteries, right? Like one of the biggest things that they need for this technology also exists in Idaho, right? With cobalt, mm -hmm. uh, molybdenum, and uh, cobalt. I, I don't. It's. Off, I think cobalt is a secondary thing that they mine when, but they're looking for. I think the more um, pertinent or the more valuable resource is molybdenum. Um, because that goes in like, I think smartphones and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but there's also gold that goes into smartphones and all that and lithium of course. And, right. um, but there's, there are, yeah, I mean, like if we want to transition to this green energy future, we also have to consider that that's going to take a lot of mining. Right. Um, and so the environmentalists are going to have to wrap, wrap their mind around that. Right. And again, coming <laughs> back to utilizing natural resources, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Because imagine that the solution was getting something that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a problem, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of like, okay, no, no, no. Say we want to address the salmon and the dams. Well, that's actually going to take batteries and that's actually going to take some other mm -hmm. natural resources and some mining. So it's like everybody has to give mm -hmm. give a little bit. But and again, I'm obviously off on the on the power generation. For some reason I was thinking it was five megawatts. Maybe it was five. That was megawatts. one project. You're, you're not. Oh, you're I'm not, not wrong. Off. No, okay. No, you're, okay. You're, that you're is right. one project. But they've expanded okay. now, especially okay. with the agreement with the current uh, administration. They the, the agreement that just came gotcha. out like two weeks ago. Um, it's going to be thousands and thousands of megawatts. I mean, that's just so wild to think about. Yeah. It's like, okay, like we're coming full circle. Yeah. It can't be, you can't have a unidimensional solution mm -hmm. to these really complex problems mm -hmm. that, yeah. that we're facing. But again, you we're standing around people that actually are doing things, which is such, I mean, I can't tell you how different it is than the world I grew up in where people had problems and they were always, I think it's uh, actually in part a, that the mechanism, look, I'm not going to go full conspiracy theorist, but mm -hmm. there is, there is a degree of presenting problems that you sell as like these incredible widespread, mm -hmm. uh, like overarching problems that should dominate your thoughts. And then also convincing people that there are no solutions to them. So right. you have people in a perpetual state of anxiety and frustration. You know what's funny? That's so, not funny. No, that's no sorry. Not... <laughs> you're, you're right. It is not funny. But I'm sorry, no, no, no. I know, I know, I know. Um, but <laughs> that specifically, and we're going to talk about the Snake River dams, the lower Snake River dams, and their impacts on salmon and how we can get our salmon back and look at how sure. we manage the river. The people. It's, it's flipped what you just said. Like we have this dichotomy of people trying to convince you that things can never happen. And usually it was the people who wanted a fix that are like, this can never happen. And like, blah, 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 playing the victim. But now you're saying it's, it's actually kind of like these people are now coming up with the solutions. We're replacing the power generation. We're right. replacing the transportation infrastructure to come up with a solution that's largely centered around bringing our fish back. But it's now it's the opposition to changing anything who's they were the ones that are working really really damn hard uh, no pun intended to say that you can't do that you cannot there are no solutions and i look at them like we put a man on the moon that is far more complex right. than replacing just building power infrastructure right. we made the iphone <laughs> like if we can make the iphone we can probably iron out some like solar panels in a dam like is anybody with me can i get an amen yeah okay. you show an iphone to somebody in the 1960s when those dams were built their brain would fry and just to, if we told them at the time we can't like this is the end all be all of all technology i mean it's just it, it's but I, the point though that I really want to stress is that like there are now people and I'm one of them my organization's one of them we are looking at ways like 
you know, went, but to, to, to replace the, infra, the, the services that the dams provide so that we can get our fish back. And we can talk about why those dams are impacting fish more than all the other dams and all that kind of stuff. But it is the people who are kind of riding this gravy chain, and there's also massive subsidies involved in politics and bureaucracy that are the ones working really hard to say, we can't do it. And so when they say, we can't replace the power, I ask, why? And they say, well, it would we would have to build this, this, and that. I'm like, well, you just said there's what a the solution. solution is. Yeah, and it's, it's right. so funny because they have said that on record. Like, the dams provide transportation for grain. We barged grain downriver from Idaho to the Tri-Cities in Washington, and I was appointed to the governor's salmon work group and a representative for the wheat growers said, well, we can't replace the transportation services that those dams provide. Barring of course, that Southern Idaho grain farmers don't need the dams. They don't ship through the dams Um, and neither do people in Montana or anywhere else that wheat is grown in the country. Um, They don't rely on the transportation services those dams provide. That's another story. But she said, we can't replace those services. And I said, well, why, why not? We, it's the 21st century. And she's like, well, you, it would require like 31 rail loaders for a train. I'm like, you wait, wait, in okay. the same breath. I get you 31 rail. Lo- what else? What, like, Cause I'm making a list. That's exactly it. And th- but this is the mindset of people like, you can't do that. It would take this. <laughs> it's just like, wait a minute. You just told me <laughs> what it would take. I mean, it was, it's silly. It's silly. And, but that's the world that we're operating in. I mean, there are people who, and, but there's, there are things underlying that. Like, I, I, I want to talk about this, um, but like the people who benefit from the remaining services the dams provide and they are dwindling and they're getting more and more expensive are riding a gravy cha- train funded on the backs of taxpayers and ratepayers. Okay, and so are, they don't want to change services? the system. What are you talking about? Because you, okay. you've mentioned Should gravy train stage? a couple of, Set the stage, baby. Let's, here we go. Okay, yeah. All right, get we're comfy. Getting, we're getting to the meat here. So just a couple of weeks ago, there was a, an announcement by the Biden administration that uh, got a lot of headlines. To begin replacing uh, the services that the Lower Snake River dams provide um, so that when the time comes um, to breach the dams, we can do it and humans who rely on the service of the dams will not be impacted. So economics industry won't be impacted. Um, That is setting sort of the stage currently for a long campaign, about 40 years or so, of this breach the Lower Snake River Dams campaign to bring back Idaho's fish. These are Snake River stocks because they come through the snake, but mostly they come through the Salmon River. Keep in mind, this is a river that was named for the abundance of these fish that existed. Okay. Lewis okay. and Clark, when they came over the mountains, uh, I think the Beaverhead, and they came into the Salmon River uh, drainage, um, they said they could walk on the across the backs of these salmon. They were so abundant. The... Salmon River is a tributary of the Snake, which is a tributary of the Columbia River system. The Salmon River used to produce about, and still has the capacity to produce about 60% of all salmon and steelhead in the Columbia Basin. So it is like the fish factory. And it's the Frank River wilderness that delineates that watershed. So it's clean habitat. There's no development. There's no pollution. And we yet we are, it's a five-star hotel for fish, but we are not getting our fish back. The main culprit I should say the main human caused culprit is the lower four snake river dams. And there are other issues, uh, other, and we can talk about those that are, that are impacting the mortality, causing mortality of Idaho's fish, certainly, but by and large, the largest, uh, and it's like 60% of Idaho's fish are killed by the lower four snake river dams. So that has been true for a long time. It was predicted before the dams were built, but it's hard to tell this story like, in today's like bumper sticker slogan politics, this is an incredibly complex thing. And when I tell IWF, speaking of doers, we decided like, this is like, if you paint the picture for people, you start to like change minds and you have to do it in person. We've been going around to city councils, chambers of commerce, mayors, community leaders, anybody who will listen to us in communities up and down the salmon and Clearwater rivers. Because we believe that those are, well, one, those are communities that rely on fish for their part of their economic engine and a diverse economy is a resilient economy. It can weather downturns better. You get rid of an industry, another downturn comes, they don't weather as well and they may not recover as well. Um, so it's an economic thing and it is big numbers, um, for folks listening to say, well, why are fish so important? One good Chinook run, this is just in the summer. You can fish from, from May to June. Um, 
one good fish return for the city of Riggins, which is like 2,000 people, 1,800 people, brought back 30 to $40 million for just like 30 days of fishing activity. That's a tiny town. I mean, cash registers. I don't know if anybody's ever, if you've never driven through Ribbon, uh, Riggins during a good salmon year. You can't park on the side of the highway. It's lined up with tents, cars, RVs, people down on the river, shoulder to shoulder. When I was a kid, I watched a gun get drawn, combat fishing. People are passionate about these fish. And it, it, so they're they're a real economic driver. And if people have never, I've never been to Riggins. I did, uh, mm -hmm. I've been obviously fishing up in Alaska, which I very mm -hmm. much enjoyed on the Kenai. Um, and then halibut fishing off of that. But the salmon, like, you go down to the bank, and there was a really good salmon run one year, and we went, and literally shoulder to shoulder, and all you just, shoom, mm -hmm. and everybody has firearms because there are bears mm -hmm. walking around because there are fish on the, like, and we were coming out of the parking lot. There's a bear wandering down through, mm -hmm. like, like somebody pushing a shopping cart, you know, like uh, 40 yeah. yards away, and there's just this black bear, and they're like, all right, let's just keep, and, <laughs> and that's just what's happening, right? Like, you can't, you can't even conceptualize mm -hmm. the mass of humanity and like the stink of fish and the mm -hmm. water going and just every the ball, ball, it's we, wild. Yeah. I mean, we would have to be sure to get our groceries in Boise because you go out to Riggins, nothing was on the shelves. I mean, it's big, serious business and it put people in the black and that's, that's, they are a, they are a fish dependent economy and they're not the only one. There are many of these towns up and down the salmon and clear water, water river. So what I'm about to tell you is what we tell to city councils and and folks who for the last 40 years have been like well breaching the dams is this environmentalist pipe dream and it's going to destroy our com com communities i won't be able to turn my light on right that is not true anymore and and i hope that people listening understand that come into this with an open mind because there's a lot there's 40 years of, of information a lot of it's not true anymore and it used to be true these dams used to be vitally important but um i, I want to paint that setting so that when we talk about this just to let folks know that um I think that those values and the things that we believe about them should are, are challenged by new information and what's happening on the ground. So right, and just a quick point: the da the a dam in like the dam doesn't have an inherent value to anyone, right? What dams were designed to do is obviously uh, electricity and then some transportation, mm -hmm. depending on where the dam is. That's the only function of mm -hmm. the dam. And flood control. But these right. specific Lower Snake River dams, there's only four of them, do not do flood control. Right. So these dams, it's like the dams aren't important. The electricity yes. is important, mm -hmm. right? And perhaps some transportation routes right. are important. Yes. And I don't know. We've had things like London Bridge bridges and other like Golden Gate bridges and whatever. Like, call mm -hmm. it the Salmon Bridge. I don't care. Mm -hmm. Like we could build a bridge that connects a road to another road and we can produce electricity. So the just inherent value, yeah. like the the un, uh, undebatable value of a dam is just – that's old technology. There's no value to just a concrete block sitting in the middle of the river. It's what that concrete block has the potential to provide. Right. And in this instance, the Lower Snake River dams, the remaining services are are, are, are electricity generation, um, which I will paint a picture of that is dwindling. And it's unpredictable. And it costs more to produce than it actually – like the electricity it produces. So it's a sink and the transportation services of which are dwindling as well. Like we used to ship all these things through the dams both ways. Now it's mostly one way from Idaho down. It's almost 95% white uh, wheat. And, uh, but total number of boats, barges going through the dams is dropped 80% from 2000 in their peak. And then it's never coming back. And the free market is the reason why the free market is abandoning this government subsidized river corridor. So, Let's let's start. Let's so yeah, let's let's go through time. the history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, why were the dams created in the first place? Well, they were built so the the, the number of dams, including the uh, the lowest dam on the in the bottom uh, Bonneville Dam, and a number of dams were built um, over the years. Um, and it started with the New Deal, FDR's New Deal, and in that New Deal was created the Bonneville Power Administration. The Bonneville Power Administration, in the haste of getting the uh, U.S. economy out from under itself, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they did not give it congressional oversight. They have one administrator. And um, unlike an, a very similar uh, sort of government monopoly bureaucracy called the Tennessee Valley Authority, which generates power over in the east, but they have a congressional oversight committee explicitly dedicated to them. Bonneville Power doesn't have that. They just have an administrator. Their sort of directive was to create at cost 
power for citizens of the Pacific Northwest. And during the New Deal, World War II is coming down the pipeline. Um, they wanted to, they were really, they were given the director just like make power because we needed to power aluminum smelters to build aircraft. And so this is a war effort thing. And um, I think it's important context because a lot of people will think is FDR as a socialist and the New Deal as a socialist program. And as we have these relics of the New Deal and FDR's socialist ideals, we have very conservative Republicans defending them now, which is just, I think, an ironic and interesting thing. It's yeah. So, um, but just keep that in your back pocket. So BPA over their history has built 31 power generating projects, mostly hydro up and down the, you know, the, 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 the Columbia river basin, there's four on the Columbia, but in, for Idaho's fish, let's just focus on the Columbia where our fish go. They come in. Um, well, first they start in Idaho and they go out towards the ocean and then they come back to Idaho. But the, 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 the dams they, um, come in contact with are four on the lower Columbia. <clears throat> and I don't know all their names off the hand, but, uh, and then there's four on the snake river. There's other dams on like the Yakima and elsewhere. And then there's also some, there's all, they also have a proliferation of wind and solar and they have, uh, nuclear Hanford. And, um, so it's, it's diversified somewhat. Um, but in the 19, 19- 40s when they were planning to build the four snake river dams we had salmon and steelhead and and salmon and steelhead were still making it through the lower four columbia dams because we had fish ladders and um the fish and wildlife service and department of fish and game of idaho and the other state wildlife agencies basically said this is going to destroy snake river fish and they were right they said this is just this is gonna we had a cannery a salmon cannery in lewiston the town of lewiston it's no it's no longer there obviously but this was a commercially not just recreationally viable industry so um they said this and and, and what they said was going to happen um came to fruition the army corps actually built the dams not bpa bpa just kind of planned like the power selling markets and transmission the army corps said and they still that this moniker still exists to this day that the amount of shipping that would so these the these dams would create a shipping port that would get ships all the way from Lewiston to the Pacific ocean. They wanted to create this like big, like, look at this, a seaport all the way in Idaho. Hurrah. <laughs> like, is that even a good idea? Who knows? But the amount of boats that would be, that would go through the locks as compared to rivers like the Mississippi, which is a huge transportation corridor. They actually referred to the snake river dams as a river corridor of minimal like use like it's still to this day so minimally used that like the army corps is just like negligible they call it negligible use so that's just important because people are like god these things are so important for shipping the army corps doesn't think so and they didn't think so before they built them they're still called a waterway of negligible use so that's just important to know um but we started so that we started building these um power plants and by the time the 70s roll around, we've built the last of the four Snake River dams right away. There's a drop in fish returns. Um, but at the same time, is this thing, uh, this thing happened that's referred to as whoops. And I'll get, it's an acronym that's basically the Washington power supply thing. And I forget exactly what it is, but uh, what happened was BPA wildly, uh, over forecasted how much power could be consumed by the Pacific Northwest. And when you have a glut of supply with not enough demand, um, that's like not great economics. And so um, Congress had to step in and pass the Northwest Power and Supply Act of uh, Northwest Power Act of 1980. And that restructured BPA. And that's important because it has implications of it, it's what created this massive Gordian knot that um, has spread BPA's tentacles, and this is a federal agency, has just spread its tentacles all over the Pacific Northwest. And what it did was it said, okay, BPA, with the power that can't be consumed within the, nor the Northwest, you're going to build transmission lines to places like California, other markets, and you're going to sell that power. And the money you make on selling that power is going to be rebated to citizens of the Pacific Northwest, and it's going to pay for fish and wildlife mitigation efforts for the problems that you're causing salmon and steelhead. So if you're a BPA customer, what that means today is if you're a BPA customer, 
um, mostly North Idaho. Um, we get some of it. Idaho power down here kind of trades a little bit with BPA um, when we, they need power and, and vice versa. But if you're a BPA customer, 30% of your power bill is paying for fish recovery efforts. Um, if you're a taxpayer, you're also supplementing fish recovery efforts through NOAA and other federal agencies. So we spend about a billion dollars, it's like 900 to 1 billion, 900 million to $1 billion on fish recovery efforts for Idaho's salmon and steelhead to no avail. We've spent $26 billion, with a B, dollars through ratepayer dollars and taxpayer dollars, the most expensive species recovery effort in world history. Let me say that again. $26 billion, the most expensive species recovery effort in world history, to no avail. We have no more fish to show for it than when we started doing this in the 90s. So when people say, you know, we're looking for ways to untie this knot and they are like, nope, not that, not that. I usually ask them, what's your idea? Because we're bleeding money right now. This is not sustainable. Not only are we paying for it, but we're also robbing Idaho's rural communities of an industry, a real viable industry. And so if you live in Orofino, 30% of your power bill goes to BPA, who is misusing your funds. You're paying part of your taxes to fish mitigation efforts that aren't working as well, and you're not getting your industry back. We are triple screwing these people. And Idaho leaders are like, no, I don't want to. I mean, nobody wants to touch it because it's a it's a political nightmare. But like that's that's the stage that we have right now. Okay, so that that is that is not it's just not sustainable. So um, that's the kind of outlook right now. Over the years, since about 2000, the people that we were selling that surplus power to, mostly California have online their own power supply system. They're now doing a lot of wind and solar. And I know a lot of people are, there's political connotations with wind and solar, but like I'm on the ground, like I'm not interested in people's partisan like beliefs about power. If your light turns on, no, people don't care really where it comes from. They don't even think about it. But again, there's like this, um, this theory that like uh, wind and solar isn't viable. It's getting very, very cheap now and coupled with battery storage. So when people don't need it, but the wind's blowing, we're at least keeping that energy somewhere that can be used when the wind is not blowing. And it is, it's a real thing that is happening and that's not hypothetical. Um, Elliot Manzer is a guy who was the former administrator of the Bonneville power administration. He left to work for an energy company in California called like the California independent service provider something i forget the acronym he they have created 8000 6000 to 8000 megawatts of storage with onlining new power generation and it's being lauded as like one of the most like innovative power generation portfolios it's diversified they're upgrading the grid i mean to say that we can't produce the power that the dams provide is just like woefully like an uneducated statement. Um, so let's get into like the power really quick. Um, the dams, we, we hear this a lot. There was a congressional hearing the other day and, and Congressman Fulcher <sighs> said that the dams produce 3,500 megawatts of power. That's not even true, um, which is upsetting because like I said before, his constituents are paying three times uh, over and um, they're not getting their fish back. And he doesn't even have the facts right to like look at this issue with a critical eye. The dams have a nameplate capacity of 3,500 megawatts. What that means is if we had the water supply behind them and we were pushing water out at 100% night and day, they could produce 35. They have the, they have the, the, the engine power to make 3,500, but because of water supply and because these are run of river dams, they don't store water, we've never gotten there. Um, on average, and these, these receipts exist, um, over the last 15 years, they've produced 950 megawatts of power. Um, so let's just call it a thousand. That's very, very replaceable. Um, the problem with those specific 1000 megawatts, and they are valuable when, um, especially during peak demand times of the year. So mostly in December and January, when people are turning on their heaters and the other times of the year, which actually requires more demand is, uh, July and August when people are turning on their ACs. If the power supply system that Bonneville has needs peak power, like most of the time those dams aren't even producing power, but 
when people all of a sudden need to turn their ACs on and they need base load power that's reliable, they'll flip a switch on the dams. That water acts as sort of a battery, but because these dams don't provide storage, they only have about 12 hours of battery, which is not that much. Okay. <laughs> like that's what people need to kind of understand. And during those times, and this why I mentioned those times of the year is important, December and January, July and August, that happens to be when they had the highest demand. That happens to be when we had the lowest supply of water. There's no, and, and the reason BPA's history is important because a lot of these dams were built with predictable snowfall and melt regimes in the 1920s. That is not the case anymore. Most of our snowpack is melting in like one month. And that happens to be in like May when we don't need the power. So when we the dams have the potential to produce the power, no one's using it. And it's sold at a loss. It is sold at a loss. So when people say if Bonneville Power was a private entity, they would have gone bankrupt years ago. So defending this bloated federal runaway bureaucracy is like in, unconscionable to me, and especially if someone calls himself a conservative, because the private energy producers that compete with Bonneville are producing energy at half the cost, and they're not killing our fish. It's indefensible. And, and Bonneville is so arrogant that the previous administrator, and the reason I brought him up aside from that point, is that he, during his work with the federal government, as administrator of Bonneville Power said, yeah, we're it's just not politically feasible to build a thousand megawatts in, in the storage. And yet then he quits and goes to a private operator in California and builds like 10 times what he said wasn't capable of Bonneville Power. So the reason what's being what's holding us back is just bureaucracy and politics. So that's that's the power thing. Um, it's important to paint a picture that throughout the year when when demand is is high, but it can't produce power. And then when supply is high, but there's no demand. We are losing money. And that's the power side of things. We can replace that with better power generation. However, there's one more service remaining. And that's and it's valuable as well. I, sh I should say it's it's valuable to a certain industry, but it's 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 diminishing. Um it's the transportation. The rivers, sorry, the dams create a series of slack water reservoirs. And they're deep enough to allow barging to take place. A number of barging transportation services have simply been eliminated over the years. In 2000, that was like the peak of barging through the Lower Snake River dams. We used to send products up, and they're like they're called 20, 20 foot equivalent units. Think of like train car stuff that they're like loaded on barges. They're picked up, put on trains. Those containers used to get like goods and serve goods shipped up the river and shipped down river that's done portland and um portland doesn't have which is like the last port down on the columbia river they don't even ship those anymore like it's not coming back that was like we used to get like eighteen thousand containerized ships shipments a year done it's not coming back um the remaining shipment um that uses that river is is wheat and it's and it's that's and it's all down river right so boats come up and then um, and they do boats do come up delivering things like windmill blades and some other weird stuff like that but like business is so bad for the port of lewiston that like well one 30 percent of their revenue is city um, of lewiston taxpayers it's just a subsidy they give 30 percent of um the port their revenue because they can't make it as a business um and then the other like significant portion of the port's income because they're not receiving what they were designed to receive, which is like imports and exports is they're a business incubator. Like all of the vacant space on the port is literally for like new startup businesses that just pay lease for the ground property. So like, yeah, it's insane. And the port of Lewiston, like everyone's like, ah, oh, we got to save the port. Guess how many people they employ. I, I wouldn't even, <laughs> I was going to say it does Seven people. So to say that this is like, it will destroy the port. I mean, my God, 
we'll have more than seven people like guides and outfitters that'll move to community if we <laughs> have that many fish back. I mean, it, but it's it's insane. I mean, like, right. So I'm, I'm pay- like this, and this is all real. Um, the, the containerized shipping, the amount of boats that go through the barges, you can, anybody can find this information on the Port of Lucent's website. They have a, a database query interface. You can get these numbers on your own. And, and the Bonneville power, the wattage, all that stuff, it's all publicly available. And, and the amount of money we spend on fish and wildlife programs um, through our rates and through our taxes, it's all publicly available. So the shipping is declining. But here's why is the shipping declining? Someone asked me like, well, that was COVID. It's like, no, it was about 2017 is when the bot- things bottomed out. Um, the reason is, um, like I said, that there's no more containerized shipping that's being done by truck and rail rail infrastructure already exists up there in fact when i was the first few months of the governor salmon work group we met up in lewiston and there was a huge mountain of grain um next to the river because nobody could ship through the dams because there was a crack in bonneville dam the lowest one on the system while they were fixing it there was no river traffic the the, they just had to move it to the trains and they were shipping it that way and and so it's like the infrastructure is already there (laughs) um but um why, why is shipping, um, aside from the containerized stuff, but it's dropping because the free market is abandoning the river. Towns like Rosalia, Washington, which is down the Idaho, Washington, north of the uh, dams, but like on the Idaho, Washington border, Rosalia is like a couple hundred people. They built their own rail line and grain terminal co-op. The farmers own the co-op, so they dictate their own prices. They built it on their own. It was like a public-private like loan, sure, partnership, sure, whatever. Sure, sure. They're never going back to the river. A town of 200 people are like, screw the river. Like, we're tired of, like, the dams breaking down, us not being able to get our stuff to the river. We're tired of being gouged by the the barging companies. We're directing our own future, just like the tribes are. And that's happening all over the place. And the, 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 the train, before the dams were built, I mean, there was a train that goes all the way to Grangeville, Idaho, where we could, the, the, the grain and other products were put on there. It still exists. You could just flip that thing back on. It would take some renovations, but, like, Congress and Mike Simpson has offered to pay for those renovations so that we don't need to rely on the dam. So like the, the infrastructure is already there. Some of it around, you know, the Northwest might need some, some upgrades, but like, that's like the cheapest component of this whole thing is upgrading the, the, the transportation. So towns, grain growers are taking their future into their own hands and they're abandoning the snake river. All the while the federal government is trying to prop up this like, damn system and people are the, the free market is speaking they're leaving it behind and so it's it's that's another thing that's kind of unconscionable to me people that think that they're fiscal responsible like they're they're fiscal conservatives they're defending when they defend the dams this this outdated and and dwindling like value federal bureaucracy that's just destroying things and it's more expensive while the free market is like, I mean, it's like, you know what I mean? Like you see like why that's it's so frustrating. Oh, listen, man. Yeah. I'm, I'm listening to absolutely everything yeah. you're saying. The, the, the several points, people don't realize that we ship We're Idaho itself is one of the largest producers of green energy and the energy just gets shipped out. And by the way, it's getting shipped out now at a loss. So Idaho citizens mm-hmm. who like their tax dollars are getting hosed. Mm-hmm. You, we have solutions to these problems. And that that's one of the biggest frustrations, I think, that, again, the people I've been talking to over the last several months, sort of like, this is not, this is not a politicized thing, right? Like you, if you need electricity, we can get you electricity, right? That's not a political problem. But the politics involved around actually coming up and engaging a functional solution are the things and again, not even like imagining a functional solution. It's like, no, 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 there are solutions right here. They're like, no, well, we can't do that. Yeah. And it has nothing to do with the functionality of it. That's like old school, creepy politics. Mm-hmm. It, you know, I mean, kind of the exact opposite of what we were talking about at the beginning of like, mm-hmm. hey, Idaho seems to be a state that really has a degree of self-determination and just giddy up and go. Right? Mm-hmm. Like, let's find a solution for these problems and and make them happen. But then understanding how entrenched certain agencies are and and how strongly they hold on to legacy mm-hmm. assumptions and mm-hmm. practices to the detriment of the communities. It's it's really unfortunate. Oh my God. It well and but here's the thing. One of the things that taxpayers 
pay for is dredging the river channel. So even though we have the reservoirs, which is supposed to make it so the water line allows for right, boats right. to come through, you still need to dredge it because the silt builds up. Taxpayers fund that, not the barging industry. The, who benefits from it? So there was a bill years ago by, and I forget, the guy doesn't, he's probably not even alive anymore, but it was basically a bill that would make it so the bargers would pay for the maintenance of the river channel because they're the ones using it, right? They flipped their lid. The barging industry lobbied so hard. They killed it. And so, so like the main, the remaining people who like don't want, like the, the benefit from the dam's existence, one, they benefit on the backs of taxpayers and ratepayers. They're, they're riding the gravy chair with biscuit wheels. <laughs> like, why would they want to let go of this, like, sweet che government cheese, right? Like, so, but, like, it's it's hurting everybody else. Um, right. So, and but. It's, and it's lack of education. I mean, mm -hmm. this, this is one, I got into a hot, high octane argument over a couple speed bumps in my neighborhood, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Back in the day, living there, like, had this neighborhood, no sidewalks, you know, and the, the, the streets and infrastructure were built in like the 1950s. Again, the small, narrow streets. And, you know, it was a starter neighborhood. Um, so a lot of kids walking to and from school, this whole thing, right? Like it's not, that's not a unique situation. Mm -hmm. And people realize they're like, hey, look, it's right next to a high school and it's right next to an elementary school. So what would happen is the high schoolers would zip through the neighborhood to skip traffic. Mm -hmm. So you have these like 16 year olds listening to T Swizzle, not paying attention at all. And then you have, you know, like a second grader walking down the street with no sidewalk, mm -hmm. you know, and it, I mean, this is a real problem. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, let's get some speed bumps here and slow people down. And people lost their minds. There was this one woman who lived in the neighborhood, who was obviously very well rehearsed at exhausting anybody who came up and was like, and she's, she's like, we can't do it. I'm like, why? And she said, well, we can't do it specifically because it hurts people. I'm like, okay, who's it hurting and why are they hurt? She's like, my mother has this, is this aging woman. She has a bad back going over a speed bump is like, she literally said torture chamber. I'm like, torture chamber. Okay. Wow. And then you know, I was I was feeling very passionate about this. So we start arguing back and forth in the public square of next door, which is ridiculous. I happen to <laughs> very much enjoy conversation and arguing and, and persuasion. So, you know, we're going back and forth. Every viable uh, um, response I had to her, she would come up with another argument. Mm -hmm. But it got down to it got down to the ridiculous level of you're destroying the planet. I was like, how's that? She's like, well, you're increasing fuel and efficiency because cars have to slow down and then speed up when they hit the speed bumps. Yeah. So you're literally decreasing fuel efficiency, which is destroying the ozone. It's like she was going down this big thing. And what was interesting is this was one of the first times, especially in the public sphere, where I realized – People don't care about the quality of the objection. They care mm -hmm. about the number of objections, mm. right? So the quality of objection in this case, say it's like the Lewiston, you know, port. They're like, you're going to kill jobs, right? Now, if you go one layer, tiny onion paper layer underneath that, you're like, all right, we're talking seven people, mm -hmm. right? People don't do that. They just say, oh, well, like you're going to kill jobs or like you're going to hurt the grain industry or you're going to hurt any jobs mm -hmm. that support the grain industry or any ports, like whatever it might be. There's such little actual inspection and almost mm -hmm. a willing, uh, a, a willful n negligence mm -hmm. on, on actually understanding any of it. All they care about is like. They want to do this. It's going to kill jobs. They want this. It's going to do this. They mm -hmm. want this. That. So like as long as you're tit for tat, like if mm -hmm. I have 10 points for and you have 10 points against, people are like, hey, there's a complex mm -hmm. issue. There's a complex yeah, issue. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great segue to kind of, I mean, to this from folks that represent grain industry, the port, all these other folks, they, they, that is – all we hear. What about this? What about that? And, and I kind of want to talk about this because you, you probably have listeners that have the same questions. You know, we always hear, well, what about the sea lions? They're eating fish. That's true. But, um, so maybe we should talk about like some of those like red herring arguments because um, I want to I, I do want to like let people know why. Why are the four dams and not the lower ones on the Columbia or the ones on Hell's Canyon, which totally block fish passage all the way up to the Snake River? Like salmon used to come all the way up to Boise. They used to go to Nevada. But the, the Hell's Canyon complex of dams, which are Idaho power dams, don't let them pass. So, like, kind of like, why are why is it these four dams? So, I'd like to give, like, a quick biology lesson. But, um, sure. Fish are born in Idaho. as And in, in they, they, they're they born in the summer. Sorry, they're, they're laid as eggs in the summer. And then um, when they're about the size of your finger, 
They're called smolts. They are flushed um, the next year in the, f- the spring freshet down to the ocean. And um, it used to take about two to three days uh, journey. And their, their faces would point upstream, their tails downstream. It was so much water that they would just swim and they'd get down, they'd get down there. Now, with the dams in place, it takes about 40 days. It can take upwards of 40 days, which is 40 days that they are not eating their marine nutrients to just start putting on body mass. They are put through a gauntlet of warm water predator species, which includes birds, but it also includes fish like bass, pike minnow, uh, walleye. And the bass and walleye are invasive, and they thrive in a lake-like environment. Wouldn't thrive if there was a river there. Um, And then there's powerhouse interactions with the dam. But the main culprit is water transport time. And that is something that is, is everybody in the industry, including the opposite uh, opposition to dam breaching, knows that that's the biggest killer is water transport time. Now, there's also a th- something called delayed mortality, just the stress of all those things combined. The next 10 days, after, once they actually get to the ocean, they just like die um, because of just like the compounding issues. So, yeah, right. but Bonneville, the thing is, because we spend so much money, one of the things we spend money on, we trap every wild and ju- and hatchery fish that we let go. And, and the hatchery versus wild thing is a different thing we can talk about in a sec. But we trap them in these screw traps, put a little thing, a little microchip that's teeny tiny. We stick it right in their nose. It's called a pit tag. And part of the things that your money is paid for are not only the operations to do that, but there's electric arrays in every single water body, natal stream to the mouth of the Columbia that has an adramus fish in it. So that every time a fish goes through, it pings. We know when it's their juveniles and we know when they're coming back up. So we actually can tell at what stage they're dying at. Idaho fish leave Idaho. They encounter these dams. And through the pit tag array system, we know that about 50 to 60% of all of Idaho's fish die from the hydro system. 50 to 60. The industry that supports the dams, they love to say, oh, there's 95% survival through the dams. The through the dams is a thing to important is, is what's important for them. Um, because what they're talking about is when a fish goes, enters the concrete and comes out the other side. That's just powerhouse interaction. They're not talking about um, the warm the warm water, the predators, the slack water, the water transport time that's been slowed down now. And uh, so they're not actually, so they love to say, oh, there's 95% survival through each dam. So just multiply that times eight. Um, and that's still a lot, but they're not, they're avoiding talking about the like secondary issues that are caused by the dams, but are not concrete to concrete. So they always, they love to promote that. And, and Congressman Fulcher said that there's 95% survival. It's not the dams. It's like, well, times that by eight and number one, and then number two, like, what about all the other things, <laughs> which are frankly, like, like, like I said, are, are bigger mortality uh, contributors. So Bonneville Power, I'm not making this up, Bonneville Power's own numbers, 50% or 60% mortality caused by the oceanward migration of Idaho's fish. That's human cause. We can do something about that. Then they spend a few years in the ocean, and an evolutionary trait of salmon and steelhead is to come back in different intervals. There's one-year fish, two-year fish, three-year fish, and we don't really get many four-year fish back. Those used to be called June hogs. You see these pictures in black and white in, in the town of Salmon, Idaho. Massive. These look like tuna. I mean, they go from the shoulder down to their feet. They're like 60 pounds, Sam. We don't even get those back anymore. This is a real tragedy. I never got to catch one. <laughs> um, but um, so the ocean has always killed about 90% of our fish. But if more fish go out and make it to the ocean, they'd still kill about 90%. But that's killing what's you know 90% of 9 million versus 90% of 20 million is obviously like twice as many fish you get back. So they always say, well, it's the ocean that's killing all of our fish. That's always been true. There's a ton of salmon species, a ton of small fish, feeder fish, like herring and, you know, tiny little fish. That's like the the basis of the ocean food chain. That's always been true. So that's another red herring argument. Ah, it's the ocean and you can't do anything about that. It's like, well, <laughs> that's always been true. So they, they spend a few years in the ocean and they come back to the mouth of the Columbia River a newish thing, which is also a symptom of the lowest dam Bonneville. There's seals and sea lions that stack up right there, but they only kill about 15% of the adults coming back. The number of adults that are like coming back this year of wild fish, it's projected to be like 9,200 fish. It used to be a million. Like we're redlining on extinction here. 
So 15% of 9,200 is like what? 150 or 1500 or something like that. No, it's like about 1500. Yeah. Yeah. 12, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Glad you're better at math. Um, I try. <laughs> it's like a thousand fish. And so people are like, it's the sea lions. We got to kill the sea lions. Then they'll come back. But if you look at the total numbers here, we're talking about 11 million fish killed by the dams. And we're looking at a thousand fish killed by sea lions. Yeah, right. So it's only adults that the sea lions are impacting. They don't eat this tiny fish. They're not even there at the same time of year. And then there's another 15% killed by just the stress of the fish ladders. Um, and we also have um, some kill from incidental kill from recreation and commercial fishing. There's gill nets in the river and there's also recreational fishermen that might catch a fish and, and wild fish, which you're not allowed to keep. And if they mishandle it, it they'll dies. let it go. It yeah, dies. Right. That's only 3%. Um, and, and again, we can manage this through the pit tags. We know what these are. And um, the birds aren't impacting these giant fish when they're coming back as adults. There's no none, none of that. Um, and then they have to come back through. So the four dams on the Columbia and the four dams on the Snake, and they come back to Idaho. The rest that make it above Lower Granite are the spawners. And the hatchery fish that make it back are the ones that we are allowed to catch and keep. But it's important to know that the hatchery fish are not the listed fish species because there is this ongoing litigation that... I, is the another sort of overarching theme to this because a judge can order management of the dam system that basically opens the locks and will make it a free-flowing river and if we did not come together to replace the services that the dams provide before a judge does that those industries are screwed the fish will do great because it'll look like to them a natural flowing river but the folks who ship wheat and the folks who want to turn their lights on will have nothing. So that's kind of like the gun to the head for people to come together to like do this before a, a judge. And the feds are 0 for 7. Um, organizations, including the tribes and the states of Washington and Oregon, have sued the feds and won seven times, basically saying they're doing they're not doing their job to do no harm to wild fish, which are listed. Um, so that's kind of the legal hook there. Um a judge has mandated changes to the river system management every single time. And that is largely what has kept fish from going extinct to this point um, where they're going to continue losing because the feds aren't doing their job managing our fish for the reasons I've already um, explained. Um, and eventually a judge can just say, open the locks. If you're not, if there's nothing else you can do and the only thing we can do is make it river like he can't order breaching, but he can basically make it. So river management emulates the best thing for fish, which is a free flowing river. So, there is sort of a reason why industry should come together to prevent that, which has been Mike Simpson's talking point. Like, hey, I, and it's not, this isn't hypothetical. Take the spotted owl. Um, we needed to protect old, like spotted owls nest in old growth. The, they were listed as a species. Judge said, well, you guys should come up with a solution to protect old growth. And then, and, but the industries, the logging industry refused to come to the table the habitat kept getting depleted. A judge stopped. That's what that would, those were the timber wars. And that's what's killed a lot of rural timber economies is because they didn't come to the table to say, how can you get what you need in a way that protects this listed species? It's a the endangered species act. Isn't going anywhere. So like the salmon, we can have the same thing happen to us. And it, so it, and so it's not a fake argument, but going back to what I was talking about, um, why we know the dams are impacting Idaho's fish over all the other things that are killing Idaho's fish um, is this reason. There are other salmon and steelhead that come back to rivers, tributaries of the Columbia River. The Snake River is one of them. But there are fish that come back to rivers that go through one to four dams. The Yakima River goes through four. There's the Deschutes, the John Day. It's all these rivers that go into Washington and Oregon. They have salmon and steelhead numbers that are doing fine. They are within what's called, this is a little science-y, a little wonky, yeah. but this is where I thrive. The smolt to adult return ratio is a percentage number um, that salmon need to meet in order to be sustainable, go into the future. 2% SAR, smolt to adult return ratio, 2% is when two adults are replacing themselves. So that's population flatlining. That's that's a plateau. 4% is enough. And, and again, these fish fish that successfully mate are producing thousands of eggs okay so like you don't need that many to survive to replace them like and that's a it's a species related thing so two percent is flatlining four percent is enough to where we can have what's called healthy and harvestable populations that means that this populations are not only replacing themselves but the tribes the non-tribal fishing interests the commercial folks everybody can get a piece of the pie no more crumbs because that's what we're fighting over right now we're fighting over crumbs economically 
culturally viable returns of salmon. You need 4% SAR. Those tributaries that I just mentioned, Yakima, Deschutes, John Day, all those, have a small to adult return ratio between 2 to 6%. Less dams, they get, they're like close to 6 um, And they fluctuate. But that percentage means like in a bad year, as long as you get back 3% or 4%, there's still going to be a fishery and they're still going to replace themselves. So even in a good year, and so it's all proportional. As long as you stay between 2 and 6, you're good. Only Idaho's fish are below 2%. And they're not just below 2%. They're like 0.7. Like Chinook are like 0.8, 0.7 year to year. Steelhead are like 1.8 in the best years to like 1.2. So if you're below 2%, you are declining. And that's why since the dams were built in the 70s, again, we've sometimes we've bumped up above the two, but we haven't gone above the 2% SAR in years. We are just slowly declining towards extinction. We have 9,200 fish that are projected to come back this year. We've been pretty optimistic with our projections. Like last year, we were like, it's going to be 12,000, 13,000. It was 10. This year, we're guessing nine. It'll probably be lower than that. And then about 30% of those will just die, as for the reasons I already mentioned, on their way back to Idaho. So we'll probably get like 6,000 back to Idaho, which is embarrassing. $26 billion we've spent for that. How is that, how is that sustainable? So when, when people say, oh, we can't do it, I ask them because – conservationists were always put in a position and, and, and to some extent we should be to answer the questions. How do we envision a future to get some conservation victory X uh, in a way that doesn't hurt people? So we have to come up with all these like really answers to complex problem, but like <laughs> we do not put the people in power who don't want anything to change in the same position. How are Russ Fulcher and Senator Congressman Fulcher and senators Rish and Crapo like going to stop the current system of instability that, the bleeding of taxpayer and ratepayer dollars, the decline of fish towards extinction. What's their plan to stop that? If they don't want to touch dams, if they don't want to like spend any money, we're already spending money, by the way. What is their plan? I haven't heard anything about what their plan is to do to stop all of this calamity. And it's like I said, it's not just fish extinction, which will be devastating. And the way wild fish go, hatchery fish will will follow. We need wild genetics to like intermix like, you know, if, if you keep breeding like dogs that are brothers and sisters with each other, you're going to have problems like genetic problems and eventually they'll just die. Um, it's the same with fish. You need to reintroduce genetic complexity. And if we don't have wild fish, we'll lose the hatchery fish too. So hatchery fishes, hatcheries were only ever meant to be a stopgap, by the way. They are paid for by rate pairs. Surprise. Another thing that we pay for. <laughs> and there's some other things that are absurd that we pay for too. Um, but they were only ever meant to be a stopgap to mitigate for the loss of wild fish until we figured out how we could manage dams in a way that would help wild fish be unimpacted. We've never been able to figure that out. Um, and so that is why we know that the lower four snake river dams are the problem because Yakima river fish, Deschutes, John Day, and snake river fish, which are Idaho's fish, they all go through the same gauntlet of mortality causes, whether it's gill nets. And I hear there's a lot of like, kind of racist undertone like all oh, the tribes shouldn't be able to do this and that well they have treaty rights too like they, they're actually allocated a certain number of catch caught fish but they don't even take that anymore and one they're also like running most of the hatcheries that allow non-tribal fishermen to catch fish but that's another story um but they're like oh it's the gill nets or oh it's the sea lions or it's the ocean conditions or it's all these number of things that people throw that, that do in some way have an impact but why is it only idaho's fish are going extinct What's the one thing that they encounter that none of the other fish do? It's the lower four snake river dams. And so that's how we know what, what, why those dams are important. And they're, caught, they're, they're, they're like, it's just, it's too many dams. It's eight on the way out. It's eight on the way back up while four on the way down for other fish and four on the way back up seems to be what they can tolerate. But the reservoirs for the snake river fish too, um, on the caused by the snake river dams they're hotter than the the water when it's down on the left the west side of oregon and washington it actually gets cooler because that water comes from like you know temperate rainforests, not the desert um so there's a biological reason why we're focusing on the dams but there's also this economic uh reason because they're not producing power anymore and they're not really providing transportation anymore and and if i a perfect way to encapsulate their sort of economic like are they that valuable <laughs> is that um one 
they provide 4% of BPA's power generation portfolio. Only 4%. So if we take them out, we just have to account build 4% more back into. It's not that hard. Um, McNary Dam, which is one of the four on the Columbia, it produces, if you combine all the power generation of the four lower Snake River dams, they together only produce about a quarter of what McNary Dam produces. McNary Dam is a massive energy producer. The four lower Snake River dams produce a quarter of what one dam does. So it's like, if someone said, let's take out McNary Dam, that would have serious electrical generation consequences. That's kind of why no one's looking at those dams. One, because the fish can tolerate them. We've seen that with evidence. And two, because those are actually important power generator projects. So that's that's why we're focusing on these. It's, it's a biological one, and it's also an economic one. Um, it makes sense. It's it makes such perfect sense it's so like it's so multifaceted and again there there's not a single thing you've said in the last hour or two hours that i'm like oh, i don't really it's like plain as day right like we have these legacy industries and these legacy practices that are dragging down unnecessarily right and, yeah and man how unfortunate we we can get we can manage the different the, the river in a different way. Everything, the remaining services that the dams provide, we can do in a different way. Sure. The salmon just need a river. We just need right. to get out of their way. And, you know, I hear things like these red herring arguments. Well, gosh, you know, um, you know, once you walk people through the biology, they're like, oh, so a sea lions just killing more. And by the way, my organization was the only organization from Idaho that actively lobbied in D.C. to amend the Marine Mammals Protection Act so that we could lethally kill seals and sea lions. <laughs> so, like, we're doing the work to do, like, all hands on deck. This is an emergency. Let's kill sea lions. Let's replace the power. Let's do all these things. Right. Right. So, like, we're not this, like, crazy environmental group that's like, ah, we can't. Like, yeah, no, that makes sense. Like, legally kill the seals and sea lions. That, like, that's, but that's a Band-Aid solution. But... You know, so, so once you walk people through that, then they're like, okay, well, I have no biological arguments. Um, how about this? My rates are going to go up. We know what we need to build and how much of it so that people's rates don't increase. This new Biden administration proposal with the Nez Perce tribe to build power, Bonneville Power said that it will only impact rates as much as 0.7%. And yet we have congressman that had a hearing about this proposal saying it'll increase rates by as much as 50 percent that's horseshit like are they the energy experts or is bonneville power i mean like there are energy energy analysts and experts who are saying we know what we need to build rates there's no reasonable there's no reason why rates need to increase right. and, and it's the same with transportation if we give new terminals to north idaho grain growers let them own it let them set prices there's no reason why the price per bushel should go up or down. We can keep, we can do everything. We're smart people if we put our heads together, but the people who oppose breaching who, who are sort of riding the gravy train of the remaining services that the dams provide have been very reluctant to come to the table to say, here's what we would want if the dams came out. It's really frustrating because like, can you imagine if your neighbor next door was like, Hey, you doing your podcast, the way you're doing it right now, like, let's just hypothetical, the frequencies you're shooting out in the world, it's making it so I can't have internet, I can't do my job. But I have this little box that I'll give you, you just turn it on, you can do business as usual, and I can also make my money. Could you imagine saying like, mm, no, I don't like your box. I don't, I don't want to do that. Yeah. Like, it's, it's like the least Idahoan, least American thing I can think of to just say, like, look at the current system, no that it's killing an industry, hurting your neighbors, whether they live downriver from you or right next to you. And to say, you know what, there is a way that I can do things differently. It won't cost me anything, um, but I'm not going to do it. It's yeah. just asinine. I, I, and it's, it's really, um, it's made me lose some hair and <laughs> the <laughs> remaining hair is turning gray because the solution's right in front of us. Like I said, before we started recording, the biology is simple. The solution is simple. What's going to keep us from going forward or what's going to kill our fish eventually in not that much time, a decade maybe, is bureaucracy meeting politics. And they are the biggest barrier to our fish coming back, not the dams. Well, I think uh, I think some of your biggest 
assets with this will probably be the population, right? The general population of, of citizens getting educated and understanding what's at stake. Those are the people, like it has to be grassroots. It can't be, you can't be preaching to the choir. So I, I really hope that people listen to this and they share it. What, what can the average person do? The average person, I used to say contact your senators and congressmen, but um, I have heard Senator Rich say, these dams aren't coming out while I'm alive. I mean, what can you do against such obstructionism for to what to what end? I mean, I think personally, Congressman Simpson, Republican from Idaho, has led the charge on this. Um, he needs to be thanked, and um, I think he needs to be uh, not promoted, but um, encouraged to continue down the path that he has set forward. He came out with this Columbia Basin Initiative in 2021. That would replace all the services the dams provide and also invest outside of just the services. Like he wanted to build a state of the art, like battery, uh, um, what do you call it? Like not a university, but like someone that R and D facility, a sure, research sure, sure. and design facility, state of the art to build up Lewiston's like economy. I mean, so people are listening the Clearwater Economic Development Region of Idaho, which is like Lewiston up to Orofino, is the only economic development region in Idaho that has not recovered from the 2008 recession. Things are not going well for Lewiston and for the Clearwater Region. And if anybody's listening up there, I apologize, but this is these are the facts on the ground. So, you know, Congressman Simpson was saying, like, what's what's let's reinvigorate that. And he wanted to put that, you know, that research facility on the ground. He wanted to provide new water infrastructure to to Eastern Idaho as a part of this thing. And yeah, people might say, oh, well, that's just scraping the pork barrel. But like, where do you want your taxes to go? Is my opinion. Like, <laughs> do you want them to go to some frivolous campaign that you don't give a shit about? Or do you want to pay for things that'll make people's lives better, right. better for our economy? And and the reason he was focused on some of the Eastern Idaho stuff, because that's pretty far away from salmon and the problems that are causing, you know, salmon mortality um, is because we're all paying for it. Like I said, BPA spread its tentacles out pretty far. Um, one of those tentacles, and this is just another insane bureaucratic nightmare. So a few years ago, um, the snake river was getting too hot when we were sending our smolts down river one, because of all the dams and all that stuff, like we needed to send more water. So there's more current to meet the reservoirs on the snake river. There was nowhere to get that water from except for door shack, which is up the dam storage facility up above Orofino and water that was coming from eastern Idaho, some of it even from Wyoming. They created, in order to help the fish, what's called the Nez Perce Agreement. And this was going to go to litigation. They avoided it by coming up with this kind of agreement. And what it does is it, it will send, BPA pays eastern Idaho um, to send water downriver to help flush fish downstream. And that comes from ratepayer tax ratepayer dollars. 487,000 acre feet of water, which is a ton of water that could be growing potatoes, could be growing corn, could be growing a number of things that Idaho loves to grow. But BPA pays for it to be sent downriver. Farmers can't use it. And by the time it actually gets to where it's supposed to be, it was supposed to be like an air conditioner, like cool the water and sure, flush sure, them. Sure. It's too damn hot because of the, the Hell's Canyon system. It just heats up. So we have this another bureaucratic, idiotic thing that's not helping fish that we pay for Instead of doing what water could be doing in Eastern Iowa, which is growing crops. So it's like another one of these things. So his his constituents are suffering because of out-of-state federal dams in Washington. In Eastern Idaho, we send that water downstream. Doesn't even help fish. Like, too bad. You're out of luck. That's the way the world runs. Like, we could untie all that. Eastern Idaho could get their water back. BPA ratepayers don't have to pay 30% of their power bills to failed fish recovery efforts. We could undo all of this. And that's what Simpson was trying to do. So getting back to your question, um, Simpson needs encouragement because he was, he took hits like on the chin over and over again from his own, you know, delegates yeah. from Idaho. And um, he needs to stay on course. Um, I know that people like everything now is so partisan. I don't give a shit what president had this, Nez this agreement that just came out. If it was Republican or Democrat, I really don't care. Finally, and this is going to require an all of government solution, unfortunately, because it's all of government that got us into this mess. Um, but it's a federal 
agency issue, which is means executive white house. It's a state issue. It's, I mean, there's, there's, it's going to require a lot, but in any way people feel comfortable, they need to encourage their leaders at the local level all the way up to, I mean, I know that this doesn't always help us sending a letter to like the white house. Like people do keep track of that. Like, saying this is the right path we want our fish back but let's also replace the services the dams provide with fish friendly infrastructure we need to hit that bell over and over and over again and when you say we need to get the grassroots level we've tried people are and this gets back to our hunting and fishing thing with how you know the 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 initiative that we passed back in 1938 people don't even know that idaho salmon and steelhead are going extinct they can see salmon on in cans in the supermarket like and that comes from alaska and it's mostly farmed fish but they don't they're we're so disconnected they don't even know like most idahoans it pulls at like less than 20 percent of like do, hey well, we've asked people we've paid for the polling do you agree that idaho salmon and steelhead are going extinct or are listed which is a fact only 20 percent of people know I mean, like we're, we're not going to win. Like, so it's that we could, I don't know if we have time, honestly, to get to all the general public, but to get to the people who have their hands on or near the levers of power, state legislators, county commissioners, um, people who, you know, our congressmen might listen to donors. That's also mayors of small towns. Those people need to speak up. So if you like live in or Orfino or Riggins or Cami or Kuski or Lewiston, you want you know, salmon or, or sorry, salmon, chalice, Stanley, if you want to have a bigger impact, ask your mayor to pass a resolution saying you support dam breach and replacing the services. I mean, that is how we're going to do it. We have to go to the grass tops. Um, that revive that, that involves grassroots movement, but we do not have time to convince 60% on top of the 20 that think that salmon are not doing great to convince them that salmon are not doing great. Because even if we do, then we have to mobilize them. I think we need to mobilize the people who are motivated now to get in touch with their grass tops. And if it's people listening, call your mayor, ask them what they're doing to support this cause because it impacts all of Idaho. Um, the, 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 the outfitting and guiding industry by and large is like they, those people live in towns that are like 500 people or less. They're the largest like contributor to the local economies. And that's true, by the way. I work with the Idaho Offers and Guides Association and their executive director, Aaron Lieberman, every week. And we talk about this. And they, are, they have a resolution since the 90s supporting Dam Breach to bring back Idaho's fish. But we need to start reaching out to the local officials now. Go to the top. Go to the top right now. Um, and it has to be especially if you live in a rural riverside community. I can't imagine, you know, like... <laughs> Um, going, you know, if you live in American Falls where there's no salmon, there never was salmon that came back there historically. That's up above Shoshone Falls. So fish never made it back. Your mayor probably doesn't care. But those places do get BPA power. And you can talk to them and say, I'm really not interested in getting power that's also contributing to destroying an industry, the fish industry in Idaho. And you can talk to those people. And that, that minds can still be changed in a place like Idaho. The other thing, I'd be a bad executive director that, you know, we do a lot of that work. I'd be a bad executive director if I didn't also ask people to contribute to the Idaho Wildlife Federation because my staff are on the ground. I have a guy that lives in Potlatch, and he talks to all of those people making those relationships up and down the Clearwater River. We we went on a flight uh, in September. We took the mayor of Lewiston, uh, someone from the Wheat Commission. Uh, some Nez Perce tribal fishery folks and a local guide up in a plane. When you get those kinds of like a guide and outfitter flying over the dams, talking to the mayor of Lewis and saying like, this is 140 miles. Like, look, you can build the, you can see the existing rail line right there. That just needs some upgrades. You just need to ask for it. You know, like that's really, really powerful. Um, and we're doing that work. We're connecting people with, you know, some of these grass top leaders who have the position and like that. So we can kind of expedite that. But all that takes, you know, time and it takes money and I have to pay my staff and they probably don't get paid enough for the work that they're doing because there's this is a big political mountain that we have to move. And my staff are working miracles. I mean, we've got we got the Riggins Chamber of Commerce to pass a resolution a few years ago asking for breaching the lower force Snake River dams that we never thought that would be possible. But it's because we got in face to face with them just like this. And it takes months to do that, right? Like, like build trust that we're not some crazy granola freaks that want to destroy their lives yeah. <laughs> that we, you know, we, we spend money in their towns, we fish there, you know, even if we can't, but um, can't live there. But 
anyways, that's, that's, I'd ask people that uh, if they like that work and, and they want to support one, we all live here in Idaho, my staff, it's pragmatic work. We, we know we're not trying to hurt anybody. We come at our issues. We're not a litigant kind of group. We think that there's a way to get fish back in a way that doesn't hurt other people. And that's how we view all of our issues. What can, how can we sustain fish and wildlife populations, sustain our traditions of hunting and fishing without hurting others? And if you like that kind of organization, I don't think there's many like that, frankly. And I get really frustrated when I talk to like, you know, we call them partner organizations that might be a little bit greener than we are who don't really consider what their advocacy might, their impacts might have on rural Idaho, especially. So we want, we don't want to do that. So if you support that kind of work, I'd, I'd ask for uh, contributions and actually through the end of the year, I don't know when this is airing, but we'll, we'll it's all matched, but we have m- several opportunities to match throughout the year. But, um, other than that, like I said, getting in touch with local, your local leaders, seeing where they're at and, um, and trying to educate them and ask them to do something, be on the right side on this one. And this, the, the tragedy of all of this, the dams have a lifespan. They will have to come out at some point. They were designed to be taken down because we knew that they would not last forever. So at some point, we're going to have to replace them. We can do it now while we can still make an impact for Idaho's fish and we're redlining. Or we can do it later when the fish are already gone. And I mean, like, that's a pretty simple, there's two paths in front of us. Let's do something now while we can have a diff- make a difference. Brian, thank you for what you're doing. Thanks. I appreciate it. I'm going to help you as much as I can. I appreciate that as well. This podcast is brought to you by MTU Studios. If you're looking to start a podcast or need content for your business or personal use, content of any type, please reach out to MTU Studios. MTUstudios.com. We'd love to help.